I'm an inventor, and I didn't even know it. I'm the co-founder of a cutting-edge technology company. Our technology is so cutting-edge that we have international patents pending and some of the best engineers in the world working for us. But I have a confession to make. When I started this company three years ago, I knew nothing about technology. The very suggestion of words like printed circuit boards, resistors, and capacitors were so far out of my comfort zone that they might as well have been a foreign language. So while I'm probably supposed to be giving all of you an inspirational talk on technology, I may not be the most qualified. So let's talk about something a little bit more fun. Let's talk about TV shows. How many of you have heard of the show Star Trek? Can't see, it looks like everyone. Star Trek was one of the most popular shows around when I was growing up as a kid. It was a cult classic that featured a starship called the USS Enterprise in its five-year journey through space. Its goal was to seek out new life and new civilization, to boldly go where no man had gone before. In the show, it featured a crew led by Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk and his team would beam up and down to these neighboring planets and go on all sorts of adventures. And no matter how far away they strayed from the ship, they could always communicate with each other through something called a communicator. Sounds impossible, right? They could just pick up these little tiny phones, and no matter how far away they were from each other, they could just chat with each other. Super fun to watch, but total fiction, it seemed, especially considering that the typical phone back then looked something like this. When I was a kid, I desperately wanted a communicator. Everyone did. But I was just a kid. But there was one man named Dr. Martin Cooper who was so inspired by the communicator that he went off and tried to create his own. So his first try, produced something that was 10 inches wide. And it had a battery that weighed about five times as much as the average cell phone today. You could only talk on it for 20 minutes before you had to recharge it for 10 hours. It was so big and so heavy that it was nicknamed the brick. But Dr. Cooper stayed with his creative idea for years and years. He never gave up on it, and it eventually led to the creation of the modern-day cell phone. And you'd probably be surprised to find out that fiction has become reality more times than you would have thought. The modern-day submarine was inspired by Captain Nemo's Nautilus in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. The rocket ship was created because a man named Robert Goddard was so inspired after reading H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds Geostationary satellites, the World Wide Web, even the iPad, all came from fictitious creative stories. Even the children's book, Tom Swift and the Electric Rifle, inspired the invention of the taser. Get it? T-A-S-E-R? See it there? So, how did I become an inventor? As I said, I have no technical background, I'm not an engineer, I studied finance all throughout college and graduate school. In fact, I stayed in finance as a career for about 15 years, always thinking that that was the safe path. And although I'd been doing it for so long, it, it never felt right to me. I always wanted to embrace more of my creative side. But embarking on something creative is risky and scary. There's no clear path, there's no structure, and there are no rules. In spite of that, I decided that I wanted to write a story. So about three years ago, I started writing a fantasy science fiction story that I called The Mighty Maru. And The Mighty Maru was a story about a group of kids that came together and they wanted to make positive change in the world. And in the end, this crew ended up becoming vigilantes and they had to go into hiding and they ended up creating their own secret society. And the only way they were able to identify other members of this secret society as the society grew why, were by these distinctive and magical charm bracelets that they would wear on their wrists. 
and being a science fiction story, there were so many different things that these charms could do on their bracelet. The members of the secret society could communicate with each other and send each other secret messages. They could sense each other's presence. They could move the charms around and unlock different magical powers. It could even let them know when danger was near. Each one of the charms on the bracelet in the story had unlimited power and capabilities. It was like the wand to Harry Potter or the lightsaber to Luke Skywalker. I love the idea of this story because I thought it reminded me of those tales of the small coming together and standing up to the powerful. But when we started testing this story out on people, an interesting thing happened. As excited as everyone was for the story of the Mighty Maru, everyone kept focusing on this bracelet. Forget about the bracelet, we'd say. Just forget about the bracelet. Let's focus on the story. But no matter who we brought into the office, the response was always the same. Can you make that real charm bracelet and have it do all of the things that it does in that story? Their excitement reminded me of my own excitement for the communicator all those years ago. Could we really make this thing? It seemed improbable, but just as improbable as the communicator, so why couldn't we? So, about three years ago, we decided, with zero experience, that we were going to become a cutting-edge technology company. And if I knew how hard it would be, I probably never would have tried it in the first place. I had once again decided to take a leap of creative faith, something still very, very much outside my comfort zone. Remember, creativity is scary. Creativity has no rules. Creativity has no structure. And creativity has no clear path. But we did it anyway. And as we started, we would have experts after experts telling us to forget about it, that it was impossible. And even when we started to make a little bit of progress, they would tell us to cut back on some of the features, that there was no way we'd be able to get all of this into one little bracelet. But we didn't want to give up, and we certainly didn't want to compromise on any of the features, because anything less than what we had envisioned in this imaginary story of ours would have felt unsatisfying. But it was scary, and I remember after about a year and a half's work, our first prototypes we created, almost none of them worked. And then we thought, well, okay, for the next year, let's, let's change the design. Maybe that'll improve things. And then we discovered that everyone thought they were hideous. So we kept at it, though. We never wanted to give up on this an original creative idea. And after several years, we're now finally excited to be introducing what we call the next band into the market early next year. The goal of the next band is to be very disruptive to the wearable space. It's to give power to people like you to customize what you want to wear on your wrist and what experience you'll have on the inside. Just simply by taking one of these charms, or mods as we call them, and putting them on your bracelet, you can completely change the experience that you have on the inside, from finding friends through proximity to sending secret messages, even using it as a game console on your wrist. And all the while having your own customizable fashion line right on your wrist that you can change all the time and protect against obsolescence. When we think about creative change and technological progress, we tend to think of it improving at a straight line, kind of like this. When inventors create based on conformity, they tend to make improvements on a previous version of something. So for example, Eastman Kodak had some of the best film in the world, and they kept improving on that film year after year. Or Blockbuster Video, I'm not sure how many of you remember them, but uh, Blockbuster Video was a favorite Friday night destination to rent VHS tapes for the weekend. But every now and then, there's a new technology that comes along that's so disruptive that it completely changes the trajectory of this line to something like this. So for example, when digital cameras or smartphones started to come into the market, or when Netflix and other video-on-demand technologies starting to, started to emerge. We saw this with great creative thinkers, like Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison, 
the Wright brothers, and Steve Jobs. Back in the early 1900s, a man named Joseph Schumpeter called this process of innovation creative destruction. So, will our next band become the next technical revolution? I don't know. Like I said, creativity is unpredictable, creativity is scary, and creativity has no clear path. But creativity is productive, creativity is generous, creativity is addictive, unworried about having all of the answers, has no constraints, and improves our lives. So I challenge each and every one of you to continue daydreaming about your next big creative idea, no matter how scary it might feel. Thank you.